And now, Kate Brandt, Kristen Seaman, and Amy Harder of Cypher. Well, hello, everyone, and good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Harder. I'm executive editor of Cypher. That's a new publication by Breakthrough Energy. We are covering the technological transformations that we need to reach net zero. And a core part of that challenge is engaging corporations, which is why I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel on the evolving role of the chief sustainability officer in corporations. And here with me today, we have Kate Brandt, the CSO of Google, and we have Kristen Seaman, the CSO uh, and Vice President at General Motors. And what I love is that you two represent such different industries, and that's why to tackle climate change, we're going to need everybody uh, from the automakers to the tech companies and everybody in between uh, to get on board. So thank you for being here, and thank you everybody for joining. To kind of open it up, I want to start with just kind of get a top line uh, sense from each of you on what your company's climate goals are and how you as the CSO are being empowered to take out those goals. Kate, let's start with you. Wonderful. Well, such a pleasure to be with you all and absolutely such a topical question. I think we were just talking about backstage, this tremendous race to the top I think we're seeing right now on corporate climate commitments. And I think that is so, so critical. So at Google, we've been doing this work for many years. Sustainability has truly been a core value since our founding. And a couple of years ago, I worked really closely with our CEO, Sundar, and we set out what we see as our third decade of climate action. So this is building on a lot of historical work we've done. Going all the way back to 2007, we committed to carbon neutrality. In 2017, we started matching 100% of our electricity with renewables. So we really asked ourselves, what's that next frontier of action? And we're looking at it really across three dimensions. The first is, how do we lead at Google? How do we ensure that through our own operations, our own value chain, we're driving change? And there, we're focused on our net zero by 2030 target. But we also want to think about it far beyond our four walls, the role that our technology can play in enabling others to take action. So when we support our partners, we're working with cities to provide them tools to take action on climate, providing businesses the solutions that they need to address their work, their work that they need to do. And then lastly, it's about enabling everyone. We have the privilege of having products that billions of people around the world use every day. We want to utilize those products to make the sustainable choice the easiest choice for everyone. And Kristen, you come from a pretty different industry with a bit more infrastructure than perhaps Google. For sure, yeah. So, so thank you again for, for having me here. Just awesome to be up here with both of you. And I love how you started it, Amy, talking about this is going to take everybody because one of the things we talk about at GM is that this transition to an all-electric future that we're focused on really is going to take everybody, and we know we can't do it by ourselves. It's going to take communities and policy and our employees to, to really make that happen. But we set some pretty bold goals in uh, the start of 2021. Um, first was to be carbon neutral in our products and operations by 2035. And I'm sorry, by 2040, and to eliminate tailpipe emissions from all light duty vehicles by 2035. So we really are on a path to change over our entire business. And it's really exciting to be at the front of that transformation and that acceleration in the industry. And, you know, it, it's like Kate said, that it's bigger than just us and what we do. It's, it's how we do it and making sure that that transition is an all-inclusive one and that we bring everybody along with us. And so we're really excited to, to make that progress. We've got commitments around renewable energy to be 100% um, source renewable by 2025 in the US and by 2035 globally. So it's really looking at it holistically. It's not just about our product, but it's also how we charge the product. So decarbonizing the grid's important to us as well. So the flip side of this big rush of corporations issuing climate goals is, is skepticism. Sometimes warranted, sometimes not. How do you as CSOs and your companies and perhaps observations you have just about the uh, corporations in general, what are some of the criticisms that you face, uh, whether it's about greenwashing or just generally speaking the, the role of corporations in addressing climate change? How do you address that criticism? Yeah, I would say it's good that people are asking questions. I think that's really important. Um, there are a lot of big goals out there, which we like, but now I think we're really moving into a phase of it needs to turn towards implementation and that that's really critical. So I think transparency is critical, right? We want to see consistent disclosures. We want companies to be reporting on their progress. 
And then equally, we need to be partnering together. I think we all have set these really large, bold goals, and it's going to be through partnership. It's going to be coming together around how do we do this across companies, across industries, whether that's you know, clean energy. We've had great success through the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance coming together with 300 companies to say, hey, collectively, we want to get to 60 gigawatts of new clean energy on the grid by 2025. Or just some recent, a recent announcement we were able to be a part of with a new commitment around Frontier. This is a group of companies that came together to commit to carbon removal innovation through an advanced market commitment. So I think it's, you know, we need the big commitments, but then we need to see the disclosure on progress, and then we need to be coming together to actually drive action. And that's where I think we're going to succeed. I love it. I mean, again, I think it's as we're sitting here, even it, it, it just resonates how much we're aligned on, on what we're trying to solve. And, you know, the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance is actually right. being hosted at GM, um, I think, next That's week. Right, so I knew that. <laughs> so exactly. it's exciting to hear everybody talk about the same things. But, it, you know, I really do think, like you said, Kate, it, it is transparency and it's showing progress. And, it, you know, I, I say I'm at a time in my career where I, I couldn't ask for anything more. Our corporate goals, our cultural goals, our business goals, and our sustainability goals are really all aligned. They're all one. So there's no, there's no arguing or debating over what we're focused on. We're focused on that all electric future and, and showing it with a portfolio that matches that. And so I think that transparency and that commitment for companies to continue to show the progress and to work together is really what's going to make the difference. Kate, I want to go back to what you mentioned about Frontier. Uh, maybe I'm not sure how much the audience is, is aware of that, but it, uh, you, you kind of skimmed over it. But yeah. it, it's, it's potentially significant. It is. Uh, and it, it's not a typical position for corporations to take. Uh, so can you tell me why did Google decide to join it? And does it reflect that there's something wrong with the status quo, with the way that capitalism exists in our society? Not to ask too big of a question on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, is that reflecting, like actually the way we're doing things isn't going to work. We need to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, for those of you who may not have seen this, a few weeks ago, we joined um, several other companies, Stripe, Shopify, Meta, and McKinsey in this joint initiative called Frontier, which is a 925 million, so nearly a billion dollar advanced market commitment. And so this is a tool where you basically say to the industry, if you build it, we will buy it. And in fact, we were, we were just talking backstage about advanced biofuels. There's other places where similar work and similar conversations are happening. And this has worked really successfully in the vaccine industry. We've seen these advanced market commitments really drive and accelerate innovation. And that's basically what we're trying to do here. We're trying to accelerate over a decade of innovation in carbon removals, both in the, na in the nature-based area as well as in the technology-based area. So this could be anything from you know, kelp sinking to direct air capture. Um, it's technology agnostic, but what we're really focused on is how do we use this major market signal to drive more action more quickly. And although advanced market commitments haven't been used in the space of carbon removals, you know, we've seen similar work of corporates sending these demand signals. We were just talking about the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance. Having that number of companies come forward and say, we're putting a stake in the ground, we want to get to this gigawatt target or this 100% renewable energy goal, that's driven so much action. It's really brought renewables down that curve, brought down price, enabled innovation. So that's really what we want to see in the removal space as well. Not to take anything away from the critical work of reducing emissions, but as we know from the IPCC report, we have to be doing both. It's not either or. So for this next question for Kristen, I actually want to throw it out to the audience uh, really quickly. So raise your hand if you drive an electric car, fully electric. Raise your hand if you drive a, a car that has a gasoline engine of any kind. So even in this pretty well-selected group of people who care about climate change, <laughs> internal combustion engines still win the day, although it looks to be a bit more even than in the traditional population. Um, but that gives you a sense, Kristen, for your goal. So now, I think, as you said, GM has a goal of de delivering only all electric vehicles by 2035. Correct. What's the biggest hurdle achieving that goal? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's the, the challenge of what comes first, right, it is one of the biggest um, discussions that we have, right? You know, you talk about the infrastructure, but when, when the automobile came to be, there wasn't a gas station on every corner, 
And so with a lot of discussion around charging stations and the infrastructure, and we are doing a lot in that space to make sure that, you know, we, we talk about everybody in. Everybody in is our brand, our mission, and when you th talk about that, it, it's meaning that we don't want to leave somebody behind. We need, we're committed to have products across every price point. They talked about it yesterday, John Doerr's book, right, that it needs to be where an ICE engine and, a, and an EV are priced at the same point so that it can be an affordable vehicle for everybody, not just an affluent, you know, um, option for people who maybe even have multiple cars in their family. And so GM's committed to have products across every price point, across every segment. We've done a lot with, with charging infrastructure. And um, you know, one of the, the products, we've invested over $750 million for charging. And that's everything from DC fast chargers to we've worked with our dealerships to we're committed for them to install over 40,000 charging level two chargers in their communities. And we were talking about your small town that you grew up in and they put a charging station in. Well, who knows better than about where charging is needed than the people that are living in the community. In the US, over 90% of the population is no more than 10 miles away from a GM dealership. So if we have all of them committed on where to put charging in their communities, maybe it's the local community center, maybe it's the high school football field. It's not just the you know, high-end shopping malls that maybe we see today. And so, so that need, that, once that's happening, people can start to see that they can live in an EV future. So I want to do a lightning round question where you answer a short answer to my short question. <laughs> uh, so on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being completely and one being not at all. How important is government policy to ensuring that you achieve your goals? 10. Yeah, I give it like nine, 10. <laughs> so, so that being said, you know, another criticism that I think corporations in general face is that corporations have big climate goals, but then people say that they go to Washington and they talk about so many other things other than climate change. Uh, and they're not actually lobbying for a carbon tax or for a particular policy, at least compared to the other priorities um, of their teams. And I know you guys are the CSO, CSO, so you're not on the lobbying team, but can you give us an insight into how you manage this, this internal dynamic, considering I'm sure you're aware of that the public perception that sometimes there isn't uh, alignment there? Yeah, so you know, I have the benefit of, before I came to Google about seven years ago, I was the Federal Chief Sustainability Officer in the White House. So I've really worked on these issues from, from both sides, both in the public sector and the private sector. And my observation is, I think one of the things policymakers really need from companies is affirmative policy proposals. They actually want to hear from us of what do we need? What do we need policymakers to do to unlock our ability to achieve our goals, but ultimately to get to climate action? Um, and so for that very reason, just a few weeks ago, we put out a new policy paper that's really focused on this key climate lever that I know we're all thinking about, which is how do we decarbonize the grid so we can meet our corporate targets, but how, so we can get there for everyone. And we put forward some very specific recommendations. We said, we need a federal clean energy standard. We said, you know what? We think that nuclear, as long as it's safe, it needs to stay on the grid right now because we need that carbon-free energy and taking it offline is gonna lead to an increase in emissions. We also think that wholesale electricity markets are really powerful. We've seen about 80% of corporate PPAs are happening in wholesale electricity markets. So we want to expand the ones that exist and then we want to see new ones in places here like in the Southeast and in the West. Also, we need to be phasing out coal. And then lastly, we need to be investing in the grid, in transmission infrastructure, in delivery infrastructure, so that we can continue to build the grid of the future. So that was really important for us to say, we want to come forward and tell you all, what is it gonna take for us to get there and have that affirmative point of view? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I said a 10, right, because it goes back to the, it's gonna take everybody and we can't do it by ourselves. And so policy needs to be supportive of the transition. You know, one of the, the biggest things that, that we've been working on lately is around equitable climate action. And it's really focused in four key areas. It's the future of work and making sure that we bring our workforce along with us that, you know, it may be the, um, you know, 80% of what the vehicle manufactured is consistent between an ICE engine and an EV. So we, that workforce is needed and important in, in how we bring them along with us. It's um, charging infrastructure, which I talked about. It's 
you know, and the, making sure that EV um, equity, right, so that everybody can have access and see themselves. And lastly, we have a climate equity fund that we started, which we've committed over $50 million to work with communities on what, how everybody can be part of an EV future. It's everything from, we've partnered now with over 20 small um, community organizations that are working on EV transitions. It's everything from, um, in California, there's a, a organization called Valley Can that's training technicians on how to work on EV vehicles. It's um, RMI has been doing things to make sure there's not charging deserts where people, you know, don't have access to charging stations. Or there's an organization on the East Coast that's using EVs to transport senior citizens in an EV to, you know, for free transportation, whether it be for appointments or whatever. So, so all of those things, though, need policies that are you know complementary and work together whether it's the greening of the grid or it's it's infrastructure changes so it really needs to be all worked together it's crazy on that point about um the the price of electric cars i mean the, the average salary of a tesla driver is two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and they almost certainly have a second gasoline car for their long day trips and road trips kristen what from a subsidy perspective in, in Congress, what are, do you, do you, are you supportive of additional subsidies or maybe tax rebates that could be more equitable because they go to the, um, the they're available at point of sale as opposed to on, on a tax return? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the important thing is, is making sure again that it's, it's available for everybody, right? Some of the, the current policies have a cap, right? So early adopters were, were maybe, um, you know, disadvantaged in the transition. But it really comes down to making sure that there's a product and price point available for everybody. You know, it needs to, there's, there's people that they have one vehicle in their family. Like lots of families have one, one vehicle in their family. And in many cases, that's their livelihood. They use that vehicle for, for their careers and their jobs and how they provide for their families. And so it's really important that it's not just an affluent um, you know, option in that we've announced we're going to have a, a $30,000 Equinox in the next, you know, couple of years available amongst all of the other exciting products. Um, but that's important to us is that it's, you know, something available across all um, product segments and price points. So, okay, uh, so Google had been the top buyer of clean energy for a while, but more recently on a total numbers basis, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, some other tech companies have surpassed it, but that's, Bloomberg tells me, Bloomberg New Energy Finance says that that's because Google is now focusing on 24-7, um, which one could argue is actually more important. Uh, can, you, can you talk about why you made that change? Yeah, so speaking of the race to the top, I think this is tremendous. You know, we've been at this for a long time. We signed our first corporate PPA back in 2010 for a wind project in Iowa. So we've been doing this for a long time. We hit our 100% renewable energy target in 2017 and have met that every year since. We have about six gigawatts currently on contract, so very large portfolio. But you're absolutely right. We have been not only continuing to meet that 100% commitment, but really thinking about how do we get to this real moonshot target that we've set out there for ourselves, which is 24 by 7 carbon free energy by 2030, which is ultimately a key way we're going to get to our net zero goal. And so what this means is we don't just want to, on an annual basis, be being procuring as much renewable energy as we're consuming you know, somewhere in the world. We actually want to be getting those carbon free electrons on the grids where we're operating our offices, where we're operating our data centers and it's matched every hour of every day. So we're making a lot of progress. Um, we already have five of our data centers in the US and Europe that are at about 90% plus carbon-free energy. And we're doing this in a variety of ways. We are looking at new technology solutions. So we've been thinking about other baseload carbon-free energy solutions like geothermal, working with a great company called Fervo that's looking at new geothermal technology. And we're actually bringing some of our AI to the table to help them execute upon it. Um, we're also thinking about batteries. We have a data center in Belgium that just brought online last month um, the first batteries that are being used at a, at a data center for backup energy storage. And then when we don't need them, they're providing grid services. Um, and then lastly, continuing to bring on very large scale renewable energy projects, whether that's a big project we just brought on in Chile last month that's getting us to about 80% carbon free energy, but also looking at new contractual arrangements like we've done with NV Energy. We're actually doing solar plus storage from the outset. So it is trying to think more holistically, moving us from not just these large scale renewable energy 
energy procurements, but also how do we get towards that 24 by 7 carbon free end state. Great. Well, for my concluding lightning round, uh, I want to ask each of you to pick one word to describe the moments we're in with corporate responsibility and climate change. Adjective would probably be the, the most sense. <laughs> I would say exciting. Yeah. Um, oh you, can't, you can't choose the same one. No, I can't use it. Um, inspi inspiring. That's great. Well, thank you, Kate and Kristen, for this great conversation and for the audience for tuning in. Thank you.